we can start masu sure hello everyone good morning good afternoon and good evening i believe people are joining from different time zones welcome to all of you hope all are doing well and staying safe i am masvi khazarika a member of energy team at wr india before we proceed to the next session i want to cover some housekeeping rules to make sure you get the most out of the webinar all attendees are on listen only mode uh, there is a chat feature feature within your webinar control that you can use to put your questions throughout the duration of the webinar we will be reading through your questions and we will try to capture as many of this uh, possible in real time uh, the webinar will be recorded and the recording link will be uploaded on wri website and the event page as well as various other public platform and the webinar is also on live on youtube uh, let me thank you for joining us today to discuss very important topic during the time when most of us uh, talking about the just transition during cop 26 uh government has already set a target to install 500 gigawatt of re by 2030 this is a humongous target currently energy generation and management model in india is centralized marked by the unidirectional flow of electricity from large power plants to the consumer <coughs> dreg system can provide reliable electricity supply to consumers in remote locations sustainable energy solutions and they overall provide greater energy security so far the technologies are mostly demonstrated in pilots and scaling up is limited in this webinar we will learn how utilities grid operators upstream energy of companies and technology providers can leverage dre applications to improve renewable adoption and create new market opportunities This webinar is a part of our series on DREG technology and policy challenges organized under Innovative and New Clean Energy Technology Forum. The objective of the forum is to enhance the knowledge, gain valuable insights and accelerate clean energy transition with panel discussion from industry leaders and government stakeholders on all the latest trends and development in renewable energy. challenges and opportunities and case studies the agenda is spread to discuss some of these points and solutions we will start the webinar with an opening presentation by my colleague vaishak kumar on gis mapping to estimate small and wind and energy potential small wind energy potential in tamil nadu vaishak is working as a project associate with the energy team at wr india His primary area of work involves tracking emerging technologies and policies in the field of renewable. He also assists the team with research and analysis on the clean energy transition in Tamil Nadu. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Masvi. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Just let me know when you can see it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. So I I will give a quick uh, brief on a study, the estimation of the small wind turbine potential in Tamil Nadu using geospatial data. So this also provides a general methodology for estimating the small wind turbine, but uh, small wind potential at a particular region. So this work has been jointly carried out by myself and my colleagues Kajol and Akanksha from the energy team at WR India. So jumping right in, so uh, I'll start off with a, a small uh, introduction on what is exactly classified as small wind turbines. So the technical definition of a small wind turbine is given by the IEC standard uh, that uh, classifies the turbines into small and large based on the rotor swept area and the operating voltages. So based on the IEC standard, uh, when the rotor swept area is less than or equal to two hundred square meters and the operating voltage is below Thousand uh, volt AC or thousand five hundred volt DC. This can be and uh, when it is operating as both on grid as well as 
of it can be both it is considered as a small wind turbine so simply put uh, what this means is that uh, wind turbines up to a capacity of about 50 kilowatt may be considered as small based on the iec standard uh, this is a, once again a pictorial representation of what we have seen in the previous slide, how the classification stands. Uh, so we can see that the rated power, like 50 kilowatt and towards like uh, 50 kilowatt and lower capacities can be considered as a small wind turbine based on the IEC standard. And in uh, India, if we see the previous uh, MNRE schemes, we will be able to see that uh, turbines up to a capacity of about 100 kilowatt is may, may, may be considered as small in India. Also, if we see the MNRE list of large wind turbines, we see that the first capacity there starts at about uh, 225 kilowatt. So this is where uh, typically the large wind turbine classification starts. And further, uh, the small wind category may be informally subdivided into uh, micro, micro, and mini based on the rated capacities. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so quickly looking at what are the different uh, certified or the empaneled small wind turbines that are there in our country, we can see that there are about uh, seven manufacturers or suppliers and with about 13 models that are spread across the spectrum of the small wind turbine category. So the ones with the lower capacity that may be uh, called as PICO, are typically used in the urban setting or for residential applications and may be fitted to seagoing vessels. Those with the slightly higher capacity between one and seven kilowatt that occur, that can be called, that falls under the micro category, can be used uh, uh, for aggregated applications to power farms, can be used for uh, rural uh, electrification, it can be used on remote locations, and it can further be used for industrial use also. Uh, the larger ones that fall under the mini category, that is about 10 kilowatt and above, uh, that, sorry, that's about uh, seven kilowatt and above. This can be used mainly for supplying uh, power to industrial applications. And also if we have like a small wind turbine farm, this can be used as a grid, uh, grid connected units also. So uh, a slight uh, small background on where India stands with respect to the small wind turbine installations when compared to the world. We can see that based on the small wind world report of 2017, the global cumulative install capacity of small wind turbines was estimated at about 950 megawatt. So uh, a major share of this was from China itself uh, and followed by US, which has about 730 and 160 me megawatts uh, respectively. These were the figures for 2017 during the 2015-2017 range. So as against this, if we check the uh, latest reports, we can see that India has only about 3.3 megawatt of small wind, and this is including both small wind and uh, small wind and solar hybrids. So why uh, some of the few reasons for the low uptake of this uh, technology, it's to do with uh, the need for uh, supporting policy frameworks and the need for business, uh, supporting business models. And also the local technicians are uh, not and need, need to be trained to service these machines. Also, when once these small wind turbines are installed at locations, are uh, installed far from locations, there is a difficulty in accessing them for uh, maintenance and servicing. Also, there is a need or of like a comprehensive resource mapping study that can actually show where it like which locations are suitable for small wind turbine installations, etc. So coming back to the study, uh, we know that Tamil Nadu has areas with high wind potential due to its uh, large wind farms and large wind, wind energy generation. So the large wind farm capacity uh, was about about, about uh, nine point six gigawatt. So as opposed to this, when we see the small wind turbine numbers, this is not more than two hundred and fifty kilowatt. Uh, so, uh, and also going further, we know that small wind turbines are a decentralized RE option that can be uh, that can be considered into the energy mix, and also it is uh, can be installed and operated at locations that are unsuitable for large wind farms. Uh, hence, there is a need of a study that uh, needs to map out the locations suitable for small wind turbines and what would be and give an idea of the approximate potential for the same. So hence, uh, the study goes on to identify locations across Tamil Nadu 
uh, that would be suitable for small wind turbines based on different criteria like wind speed, proximity to uh, energy demand centers, etc. And also uh, considering the specifications of the certified wind turbines, uh, the potential is also estimated. So as previously mentioned, the methodology utilized is like a multi-criteria approach where the shortlisted locations, uh, the locations are shortlisted based on the average wind speed as well as the proximity to the demand centers. So once the locations are uh, shortlisted, uh, sample certified uh, wind turbines are the specifications of certified wind turbines are utilized to estimate the potential. Going through the uh, conclusions one by one. So from a wind resource standpoint alone, that is considering areas with a wind speed of greater than four, uh, considering an average wind speed of uh, greater than four meters per second, we see that about 18% of the state is suitable for uh, the installation of small wind, turbine, small wind turbines. This is from like a purely the average wind speed standpoint. So going a bit deeper into this and uh, looking at the regions uh, uh, what the average wind speeds are and categorizing the districts, we see that about 21 districts in Tamil Nadu have suitable locations where small wind turbines can be installed. So the map on the left shows uh, the, uh, uh, the average wind speed plotted on Tamil Nadu and the darker the color, the more the average wind speed that's present. Also, the districts falling in these locations are ranked based on the wind speeds also. Uh, next, uh, we see that there are locations in Tamil Nadu where there is a good wind resource, but there are uh, no large wind, wind farms or large-scale wind extraction is not carried out. So uh, looking at these particular locations, we can see that there are seven such districts. And this alone uh, approximately amounts to about uh, 10,000 me megawatt of uh, potential for the installation of small wind turbines. Uh, next, Tamil Nadu uh, has a large coastline. And uh, of the 13 districts, about seven are suitable for the installation of small turbines from a wind resource standpoint. So this uh, accounts for about 835 kilometers of the coastline that has the sufficient wind resource uh, for installing small turbines. And this adds another uh, 720 megawatt of uh, installation potential. Coming to the proximity to energy demand centers, uh, we investigate uh, locations uh, with agriculture or rural habitations, MSME clusters, and major cities. And considering all these, we find that there is another, uh, where there is about 3,389 megawatt of additional potential uh, for the installation of small wind turbines. Uh, next, uh, considering all these uh, different criteria together, uh, we see that about 18% of the state is suitable when considering the wind resource. And the districts of Tirupur, Coimbatore, Tirunelveli, and Krishnagiri uh, demonstrate an overlap of good wind potential and multiple demand areas. So these di districts are suitable from a multi-criteria point of view. And so is the coastal districts of Nagabatnu. So considering it together, the uh, total potential was estimated at about 4 gigawatt for the installation of small wind turbines. So looking at the map to the left, this is uh, plotted using a multi-criteria approach using a GIS tool. Here we see that the areas marked in dark green are suitable areas where small wind turbines are, uh, and the deployment of small wind turbines are suitable from a multi-criteria point of view. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vishra. So uh, yeah, that's that's a great presentation, Vishak. I mean, uh, I can, uh, I mean, uh, we can see how better data and tool like GIS can help uh, to estimate RE potential in any geography. Thank you, Vishak. So now uh, I, I would like to request everyone to uh, put their uh, uh, queries or questions on on Q and A box so that. Uh, or uh, presenter can look into it and uh, address your question. So now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Ravindranath from Unitron for his presentation on high power wind turbines for space constrained applications. 
Mr. Ravindranath has started his career with ISRO Sri Hari Kota, worked as a development engineer on antenna tracking drive system. He started his own farm by name of Unitron system to manufacture totally indigenously designed medium capacity to online UPS system, AC drivers, and switching regulators. Unitron system diversified into manufacturing of wind power and wind solar hybrid system in 1996 and introduced the small wind power into the country for the first time. Today, the install base exceeds 4,500 kilowatt, including exports to U European Union, USA, Australia, and Far East. Thank you, sir. Over to you. You are on mute, sir. I mean, is there a screen sharing available for me? Uh, let me see. Hmm. Uh, so you want to share your screen? Yeah, there is there is a, a feature. One minute. Can you can you see my screen? Uh, not I think the screen sharing is not come. Can you, ah, share oh. screen. Yeah. Okay. Screen. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Not okay. yet. Sir. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, now it's coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see your screen, sir. Thanks. Okay. I think it is not coming full screen. Ah, yes, full screen. Now it's coming. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, already introduction is over. I think we can skip all these things. I mean, uh, this, I mean, uh, you can see we have already, I mean, uh, one of the first to uh, take, uh, I mean, to have a trist with wind energy when uh, uh, nothing was available in the country. I think hats off to MNRE, Dr. Bargao, that time he encouraged us a lot. Now I think he's retired, if I'm right, from MNRE. And these are our standard models. And uh, you can see these are the 3D rotor models, which are actually meant for space constraint applications. For these turbines, standard kinematic equations do not apply. I'll come to that uh, explanation in the subsequent slides. And we have been also uh, associated with uh, NIDEC. It's a, a very popular company in Japan. Who For them, we produce alternators here in our, at our works. These are our uh, brief about our test fixtures. Unlike uh, large turbines, small turbines, there is no supply chain for small turbines. I think Mr. Kumar should notify this. This is also one of the hindrance for small wind industry. There is no supply chain. Everything you have to be in-house dependent. These are a closer path of wind turbine. And uh, this is actually the global potential of small wind turbines. I mean, uh, this almost coincides with what the Kumar has also portrayed. And uh, if you look at in, in terms of wind energy, actually global potential is uh, extract, which can be achievable or harnessable in the energy is 1400 terawatt. Actually, wind is nothing but 3% of uh, solar energy is converted into wind. Even with 3%, even with you will be able to uh, power the world energy demand today. <laughs> you can, I mean, you can look at uh, uh, potential of uh, wind power. Why small wind energy? This is the uh, World Bank's uh, survey. Uh, once again, uh, it will... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, it will come. I mean, it will actually what Mr. Kumar's finding it will uh, somewhat uh, uh, sync with his finding. Is only about twelve to fifteen percent landmass is meant for large scale uh, extraction, but whereas uh, uh, twenty to twenty five percent uh, landscape uh, landscape is not suitable for any wind, any kind of wind energy, but sixty to sixty five percent of the landscape of the world has potential if you properly plan and do its potential for small scale energy, wind energy. You don't need uh, roads, you don't need uh, cranes, you don't need maintenance like the large turbines, unattended operation is much, very much uh, 
possible with small scale wind turbines. Now this is, is the spherodynamic rotor. It is known as uh, spherodynamic fluid flow. Uh, actually this uh, uh, area is not applicable uh, for this equation here. It is something like a volume, it's, uh, this turbine sweeps the volume. And to look at a, at a glance, if somebody sees, they think it is a drag machine. It is definitely not a drag machine because the tip speed ratio will cross as, as much as four. In a drag machine, tip speed ratio is one. So this is the uh, view of the turbine. So as I view, you can see, when at a first look, you feel that pressure is on the front side of the blade. It is not like that. It is high pressure is created on the hind side of the blade, hind side. So uh, the front side of the blade will create a temporary vacuum when it is rotating. So it is a push-pull action. The blade, uh, preceding blade is sucked into the uh, vacuum created by the uh, first blade, like that it is. That's, that's, some, that's how the energy is multiplied. So it looks like a pressure vein, but it is not pressure vein again. So the blades are made using VTF, vacuum thermoforming. So once uh, uh, you, you can uh, use any kind of engineering plastics to produce these blades, either you can use polycarbonate, you can use ABS, you can use reinforced uh, uh, systems. Uh, I mean, it's basically, you don't need a complex die structure for this. It's basically sheet is formed under vacuum uh, uh, and uh, thermo thermally controlled. The advantage is first, uh, uh, number one is that uh, noise is practically 25 dB even at full uh, energy production, which is nothing. And then it is, uh, uh, I mean, inter turbine spacing is not that critical. I mean, we're not very critical. That means it's that 3D, 4D is less influence for these turbines. So it can put more number of turbine in a compact space. Just a 100 kilometer expressway can accommodate about 100 megawatt approximately. So we we'll look at and the longer life of the components because of lower RPM. And this is one of the very interesting applications. Normally, conventional turbines do not work under uh, artificial wind flow. That means waste wind recovery. Uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, a, a normal turbine have something called static. They can develop back pressure, it is possible. In this, uh, in this rotor, there is no back pressure at all. That means there is no load on the prime uh, mover or a blower motor, which means you can effectively extract energy as high as you can see here. Uh, uh, it's about 1.5 to 1.8 kilowatts of power possible from a 15 HP a blower, 15 to 20 HP prime blower or whatever blower motor you may call it. So we have these and generally industrial blowers work 24 seven. So you can imagine the amount of energy saved for 24 seven, almost 80% PLF. So this is actually a real world example. We have done, a, done an installation at JK Lakshmi Cements. Each cement factories have about 40, 50 blowers like this. The blower, but, uh, I mean, when the, I mean, you can suitably space the turbine in front of the blower exit, and we have clocked as much as uh, uh, about VFD speed at 35 hertz. We clocked about 600 watts, and about when at full speed of VFD, we clocked as much as 1.45 kilowatt. The same thing if it was a normal conventional turbine, the power would have been not more than 80 watts. You can see the difference. So you can modify the duct outlet for better, uh, in a, I mean, wind spread also, so that uh, the entire hub, I mean, the swept area is uh, receiving good amount of wind. This is another interesting application. So most of the substations have, the substation load itself is about 200 kilowatt, generally, most of the substations. So near, near the substation, something called gantry towers. So now Adani Power has approached us to uh, try to explore the possibility of installing the turbine on uh, high, I mean, high, tension, high tension transmission tower. You, if you can see that almost eight turbines around a particular height of the transmission tower can be installed very easily. 
because of the short diameter and the, you don't need the extended cross arm, very lengthy one. So there's no load on the tower. So about 24 kilowatts is possible per transmission tower. So generally gantry towers will be about 10 to 15 in numbers uh, for any substation. So most of the substation load can be derived from the wind energy installations like this. This is another interesting application for mobile telephone. Most of the cell towers are 50 meters in height. So you can either install on the top of the antenna or somewhere in the midway in between, you can have uh, cross arms and install one or two turbines like this so that you can balance the static load on the towers. This is one application for telecom tower. Another interesting application is for uh, moving. See, since there is no static, no back pressure, this can be installed on moving vehicles or boats like this. Now you can imagine a three kilowatt turbine on a uh, conventional three kilowatt turbine looks like this. So it is virtually not possible to install on, uh, 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 I mean, spear, uh, uh, boats like this. So you can see compared to conventional three kilowatt, this three kilowatt is very tiny. So it can be easily erected on, uh, uh, I mean, trawlers, boats and all. Now this is Goa uh, fisheries, the government have approached us to install tur turbines like this on their fishing trawlers. The fishing trawlers need steady kilowatt, uh, steady power requirement of five to 10 kilowatts for uh, uh, I think deep freezers or so many things are there on the trawlers. So they want to power up, extract energy like this installing on the trawlers. Another interesting application is putting the turbines on expressways. See, uh, you can have, uh, uh, see with the uh, EVs becoming more and more penetrating Indian market, you need a, uh, Highway charging applications is one of the excellent solutions where, say, near the toll gates or something like that, you have extensive uh, areas available. You can fill the roof with solar and small turbines closely packed like this. So you can uh, say about uh, one megawatt is possible. So which can charge almost, I think, uh, 200 to 400 vehicles. I mean, EVs about 200 for 100% charge or 400 vehicles for 50% charge. You can design for electric vehicle charging like this. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is uh, on building rooftops. You can easily accommodate turbines like this. If you see, especially on the facade of the building, ocean facing, west facing, you can install the turbines available, uh, small, what you call uh, on a multi-story rooftops. It's very much suitable. There's no noise, no vibration. You can easily install on multi-story buildings like this. My own house is powered by a seven kilowatt hybrid. You can see here. I mean, we have solar and this wind. And uh, we have recently acquired about two months back, I purchased an electric vehicle. In the last two months, I have not charged using grid at all more than, I mean, about 100, about 1,000 kilometers I have done entirely on hybrid energy. It is, uh, I mean, I've taken a cable drop and this is the wall charger in my parking area. It is charging the vehicle using my hybrid. I think uh, that's all for, for my presentation. It's the last and final call to save our earth. And uh, I'm sure uh, uh, seminars like this will be eye openers and I'm sure WRA will take it forward. And we look forward to uh, uh, seeing a small wind turbine uh, expanded in our country as well as neighboring and other countries. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. A uh, very insightful presentation indeed and, and the initiative uh, taken by you and your team. So, and also we have seen the challenge you are facing, I mean, developing small wind turbines. Uh, unlike the large turbines, there is no supply chain for uh, this uh, small wind turbines. So everything you have to develop in-house. So that's great. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. Uh, I would like to next uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, Basket, uh, there is a question for uh, Mr. Ravindranath. So probably. Yes, uh, yes I'm there. I'm there. Yeah. Okay. So, so there is a question for you. Uh, okay, no problem. 
So are you uh, also manufacturing vertical axis wind turbine? Vertical, uh, we have not then... yet. Uh, we are working on uh, vertical axis for uh, vehicle. I mean, uh, this thing, but still not. Uh, it is, you know, that everybody knows vertical axis is not as efficient as horizontal axis. All many experts do agree on that. But still, it needs. We are working on a particular model, but not actually for uh, rooftop applications. It is for uh, extracting from uh, vehicular traffic to keep the to install the turbine on the median of the expressways and the draft created by vehicles. We are trying uh, uh, trying a possibility to extract an energy like that. Maybe by middle of 2022, we should be ready with some prototypes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Ravindran, could you uh, stop sharing your screen as well? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think there should be an option. Yeah. I, uh, I did. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Okay. So next, we we'll go to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, P. Subramaniam from Tamil Nadu Agriculture University. Dr. Subramaniam is professor and head of the Department of Bioenergy. He is in this academic sector since last. 24 years and involved in various research work such as energy requirement in agriculture sector, renewable energy sources, national biogas and manual management program, production of biofuels, design and development of pilot scale ethanol production from cassava stands, who name a few. Currently, he is engaging with MNRE sponsored research work on biogas development and training center. He has authored 19 international and 22 national research paper. Today, his presentation is on advance in biomass convention and biofuel production technologies. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, we can see your screen, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, very good afternoon, everybody. And uh, uh, can you please extend my, my gratitude to the World Research Institute for giving me the opportunity because, as I said, we are in this area, we are working on this bioenergy or biofuel production systems. Uh, since our department started during 1982, we are working on that. Uh, and what initially I have some introduction, anyway, I'll be completing within 15 minutes. So, what is the need for the biofuels? What is the problem with the existing fuels of petrol, diesel? And we are very well accustomed with all these things. The problem is the crude petrol uh, import. We need to depend on all other countries as per the dream of our uh, ex president, the great Dr. Abdul Kalam. We need to go for the energy independence. Not only our independence, we need to go for energy independence, means we should not rely on any other country for the supply of any of our fuels. Then uh, you ask what is the source for that? Obviously we have, we are nearing about 140 million uh, crores of people. Uh, we feed all the mouths of this 138 crores of people in India. We have attained sustainability in agriculture. We have the production, but there are some problems with the post harvest losses. So we produce all the products. For example, if you produce wheat or rice, if you produce rice, so we are not producing only the rice. The addition to rice, we produce bran, we produce rice husk, we produce rice straw. People in Delhi, you know more about the open field, the combustion of the rice straw, and you have the problem of the smoke. Then what do you do with these uh, all the byproducts of the field? So we can have some production of all the fuel. So my um, Presentation is about what are the different technologies are available for the production of different biofuels uh, through which we can generate not only biofuels, so many other value added products also. This is a problem with the food petroleum, everyone knows about that. This is due to COVID situation. We have a lesser import during 2020. And still, again, we have gone back to our original position 21 and 22. These are the problems of the greenhouse gas emissions due to all our 
activities either by industries either by uh, vehicles all the pollution so I, i just i want to expose all these things i don't want to discuss about all these things so global warming again ocean and the reduction of the glaciers finally increase of uh, the sea level and the extreme events so what we suggest let's go for the biomass already i justified the availability of the raw materials it's around 680 million tons annually we are producing in india we don't be convert all these things through these technologies to the required our fuels for example bioethanol can be produced from sugary cellulose or starch materials that is equivalent to gasoline so instead of getting petrol from other countries we can produce bio ethanol similarly you can produce biodiesel from possibly raw materials of any of the vegetable oils other than edible so that is equivalent to diesel so these are all the biodiesel so that's what we suggest what are the different bio biofuels i am asked to give the information about different technologies i will be giving all the technologies for the production of biofuels so we have four different generation first generation is about usage of the edible materials for the production of fuels like hydrocarbons the second generation is non edible like lignocellulose and animal fat for production of uh, um, bioethanol as well as biodiesel respectively third generation specifically we grow some crops like algae which has some more productivity with the respect and also it consumes more of carbon dioxide at a disadvantage the fourth generation again with carbon dioxide capture so it is being done started doing on this and when you go for the biofuel policy we need to reach 175 gigawatt by 2022 and reduction this much and non fossil electricity i'm happy to say that we reach 25% of electricity through renewable energy and around 12 percentage from hydro that is also coming under renewable now so we crossed to 37 percentage already so definitely during 230 2030 we will be crossing this 40 percentage and especially to biofuel we are relying on our road transport is 6.7 percentage on gdp and we have using the 72 percentage of diesel and 23 percentage of petrol so the possible reduction of this diesel and petrol will have effect on our uh, import so now we have blending less than 2 percentage but now we have the different data it's around 4.7 percentage of blending is being done with bioethanol with the gasoline similarly biodiesel is very meager amount so we have the expectation of uh, blending of 20 percentage uh, during 2025 this has been revised from 2030 to 2025 so these are the different options even bio cng which is uh, uh, biogas production that is methane production from all the biological resources so these are all the feed stack availability in india during 2030 different crop residues fast residues uh, then used cooking oil municipal solid waste energy crops we have plenty of sources in india with respect to all the raw materials so we have don't panic about all these technologies we can go for possible technologies i will be giving some simple technologies in my later slides and ultimately we can go for diesel or jet fuel or gasoline which are being conventionally used in our day to day life so again another one is these are the about the road map of the technology development we have very few commercialization ready technologies we are in the pipeline to start with the research or the prototype or the demonstration so we have better scope of development of the technologies through which we can generate more biofuels from the available biomass uh, so what are the different routes generally it can be classified as thermal biochemical and so thermochemical we have three different technologies combustion everyone knows about that burning of the fuel another one is gasification which generates syn gas the last one is pyrolysis in the absence of oxygen it gives all the three states of fuels like solid liquid and gases biochemical aerobic and anaerobic this gives fermentation so bioethanol as well as the biogas so that is a methane enriched gas is also produced through fermentation the last one is the biodiesel production through chemical Uh, processes called the transesification so i'm not much in going into that combustion everyone knows it which consumes uh, oxygen and it releases carbon dioxide but as is this from the biomass it has been already consumed the carbon dioxide when during its life growth so this is called as carbon neutral another process gasification uh, 
uh, this is a simple process here instead of giving more of oxygen we will be supplying less of oxygen due to the reduction of supply of oxygen by 20 to 40 percentage we will be generating one gas called producer gas in indian term in general term it is called as syn gas synthetically we produce a fuel gas which the combination of carbon monoxide and hydrogen these are the combustible gas composition so through this we can have engines we can run engines with this um, uh, gases will directly we can generate electricity even some of the cases it has been connected with the grid also another one is the paralysis that is absence of air these are the traditional technologies we produce some energy enriched um, products instead of that we can go for some uh, scientific method through which we can produce the same product as well we can produce liquid fuels also these are the bio oils this is similar to crude oil we can have refinery systems so, so that we can produce different uh, fuel components as well different chemical components like phenols alkenes alcohol so many other things it has around 30 300 to 350 components in that and another that solid product is activated carbon which has a different applications now you know that it has a major adsorption characteristics so it can be used for the adsorption even in our household purifiers are having this activated carbon it's called as a battery so that will adsorb all our microorganisms and that's claimed from them and it can be used for the production of graphene also now we are working on that it can be used for the production of carbon nanotubes and also molecular sieve it has a specific application in adsorption these two are used for the electric electrodes generation in which the carbon in supercapacitors are in general batteries so this co processing as i said the liquid which is a bio crude can be mixed with the crude oil in our regular refinery and all other processes are all same so the fuel production which is related to or from the bio based material and the next route is biomass based and it is said aerobic and anaerobic one is biogas plants you might have seen all the cattle dung can be converted even liquid waste from agro industries like sago industries or some fruits or jam industries pulp industries all the liquid waste can be directly converted into a biogas that is methane enriched the gases fuel so that can be directly used in our household if it is a smaller cattle dung based or in the larger scale it can be um, directly used to run the engines and that can be used to generate electricity and there are so many grid connected this gaushalas which are having more than 500 1000 uh, cows they are using such type of technology for the production of power and it is connected with the grid amanari has some um, programs to encourage such type of people then alcohol production is another technology it's a well known technology like wine filtration they started with the grapes like sugar based material instead of that we can go for cellulose or starch based materials so here the usage or the availability of so much of rice for now people are working on that the technological uh, interventions have been done this is available and commercialization is set to be done because the economical background is somewhat weaker still people are working on that for the production of bio ethanol from rice straw or wheat straw so these are the products that can be used for production of bio ethanol so these are the availability of the um, materials through which there are uh, scope for the production of ethanol and the last word is about the chemical conversion directly this is called as transesterification which can be used to produce biodiesel which is equivalent to diesel so any engine can be run with this biodiesel or it can be blended with biodiesel and diesel so any vegetable oil we started with working of with jetrofa there is a problem in the production of the jetrofa as expected in some of the patches not being grown up so any vegetable even used cooking oils we are supposed to use only once so that can be used in uh, in the industries or in transesterification process you can add methanol and you can add a very few catalyst in which a coh it's not a secret we have a open uh, process is available so from that if you segregate such type of a component like glycerol the remaining is a ester that is called biodiesel so this can be directly used to run the engines so these are the last part uh, process 
So biorefinery, refinery as we know from the crude, we have a different component. Similarly, here biomass is available, plentifully available after feeding this uh, 138 crore people. So all the byproducts can be produced, then be converted through all these processes which I have already explained. So these are the different possible biofuels from this biomass. So these in comparison, the GHC emission is also compared. This table is available, it can be compared the diesel as well as uh, petrol. So these are the information I want to give about the possibility of biofuel generation uh, from the available biomass. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. I mean, you have taken us through very important technology. So now maybe we're going to discuss more during our panel discussion. Uh, is there any Q and question? So maybe we can go to the, our next session, that is panel discussion. Today we have an esteemed uh, panel who will discuss the suitable technologies, latest development, challenges and opportunities for the state of Tamil Nadu, Jharkhand and Assam. During this discussion, we will look at the DREG technologies pertaining to small wind and bioenergy, their suitability for deployment, the challenges pertaining to its scaling and wide, wide, wide adoption and how we can ensure that DREG and centralized grid can complement to each other. We would also uh, welcome Dr. Subramaniam to join the panel discussion. Let me introduce our other uh, esteemed panelists. Mr. <coughs> George Ayerja from Minvayu. Mr. George Ayerja is an electrical engineer with over 30 years of experience in renewable energy and machine fabrication. In 2010, he founded MinBio, an open source circular economy project in Orville, India, with the aim of imparting training for rural youth for manufacturing and maintaining robust, low-cost wind turbine system. Our next panelist, Mr. Zon Daniel Petillo, representing World Wind Energy Association. Zon Daniel, has been working for the World Wind Energy Association since 2010. Currently, he holds the position of Market Research and Development Manager. He is also coordinator of all World Wind Energy Association small wind activities since 2012. John Den Daniel has been deeply involved in the collection of statistical information related to wind energy. Uh, our next panel is actually Dr. Sachin Kumar, who could not join due to the, I mean, he is not well currently. So uh, I'll go to the next panelist, Dr. Vanita Prashad from Revi Environment. Dr. Vanita Prashad is an environmental biotechnologist with more than 25 years of experience in related field. She holds patents for innovations in the field of waste management and renewable energy. She has floated her own company, Revi Environment Solution Private Limited in 2017, focusing on improve, improvisation of conventional biomethanation process and has been recipient of Biodoc Big and Spurs grants. Uh, this session will be uh, moderated by Ms. Uttara Narayan. Uttara is manager for energy governance at WRI India. Her work involves the use of interdisciplinary approaches to address challenges at the intersection of environment, social justice, and development. Her work looks at ma making the clean energy transition accountable by using an equity lens. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Over to you, Uttara. Thanks a lot, Master, for all the introductions. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to the panel discussion. I hope you can hear me well. Um, as Maspek introduced, we have a distinguished set of panelists representing academia, think tanks, startups, and local community engagement, working on small wind turbine and bioenergy technologies. Now, um, based on the presentation that we also heard before this, um, let us start with the big picture. So I will address my first set of questions to Mr. John Daniel from the World Wind, Wind Energy Association on how we can really you know, connect the global 
our clean energy ambitions and what he is experiencing at that global governance scale with local action. So my first set of questions to Mr. Jean Daniel is on what opportunities exist for adoption of small wind turbine technologies at scale? Um, and what do the conversations at the global level indicate? And uh, if possible, it would be useful if you can share some examples of uh, success and what factors that you think uh, are contributing to that success. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here today. Yeah, I mean, the, today in, in this session, uh, we hear about small wind and, and bioenergy and, and biofuels. And I, I think the best way to, to feed it a small wind uh, at the big scale is actually by having con together with other technologies like biofuels or solar energy. So the, the best way is to have actually to have hybrid systems in places where you have wind like Tamil and do. So the best way would be to combine these with solar and, and biofuels or bioenergy. And in that way, you actually are covering the, your whole electricity and you are also not needing any kind of a storage, any batteries, anything. So in places like Terminal do what you what you will need is actually some kind of a policy or incentive that will promote actually the use of hybrid systems. And we have seen in many countries, uh, small wind has been active since uh, 40 years. Uh, probably the, the biggest market are China and the US uh, and our countries will actually have the, 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 the policy for the incentives for the longer term. Uh, in other countries like European countries, for example, we have a boom in 2012, 13, 14 uh, with feeding tariffs that were very good for small wind technology. But unfortunately, they, they didn't last too much. So after a few years, uh, the, the, the policymakers, they, they reduce the feeding tariff or they just cancel it. So all these uh, companies actually when, uh, have difficulties to keep. So for, for me, or in my opinion, what you, what you will need is, is to have long-term incentive policies for small wind. It, it does, they don't have to be very good for small wind uh, you know, to create a boom. Uh, but it have to last because ultimately the, the main benefit for small wind uh, of, the, of using small wind technology is the possibility to create jobs, local jobs. Because when you talk about solar PV, it's good, it's cheap now, but in most of the cases you're importing the technology uh, and you're just installing the, the systems there. But for small wind, you see you have companies in India like Unitron and, and when you have good policies, then you will have new people from this, from your country creating new companies and having creating some new jobs. And even you can export these machines to outside. So, so you are creating an economy and there's a main difference when we talk about PV and small wind, uh, the possibility to create jobs. So it has to be, you have to view it in that way so you can have better policies that can last long and then you can create some, some companies in the country. So th I think that's the key uh, right now we have, uh, Three or four countries, we have uh, good installations in small wind, Japan, you have Italy, you have US. Uh, but at the end, you know, the, the, it's just having this boom because of the design of the policy. And we hope that it lasts, but uh, I think the key is to have longer term policies. Thank you very much for that. And I think two key takeaways was, yeah, um, how do you link the two technologies and I think you segued very well into the next uh, point of discussion, which is on the possibility to create jobs, which is uh, sort of fundamental to thinking about the sustainability and long-term of that. So thank you very much for that. And um, I'll now, so let's zoom into the ground level. And, and since Mr. Jean Daniel spoke about jobs, I think the next, next question is to Mr. Jorge, who founded Minvayu. Um, uh, which caters to sort of local needs uh, through small scale, low cost technological interventions with small wind. So uh, Mr. Hoge, as, um, as Mr. Jean Daniel was mentioning about this possibility to create jobs and within that you're also working on one specific bit about, um, you know, uh, building capacity and skilling. Um, so given that and also Minvayu's experience of actually implementing at the ground level, um, what lessons can be learned and replicated from Minvayu's experience? 
And how do you see um, Minvayu's efforts of skilling um, within this larger jobs and upskilling conversation that has become crucial uh, for the larger transition conversation as well, which Mrs. Ron Daniel was mentioning? Sir, you want to mute, Mr. Jorge, can you hear us? Uh, you are on mute, Mr. Jorge. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Okay, super. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I agree with, uh, with John in uh, regard to the incentives that are needed also for uh, small wind and in general most of the small uh, renewable energy technologies uh, to become successful. But in our case, for example, we worked in uh, open source technologies uh, and we've been working with NIWE, the National Institute of Wind Energy uh, based in Chennai. And uh, with them, we've uh, promoted uh, training programs. And uh, the training programs have been involved in uh, developing the know-how of how to build small wind turbine systems as a uh, a job seeking opportunities for rural development. And uh, so you could say that uh, in our view, in, in, in our experience, uh, expanding the know-how, how to build the turbine uh, helps develop the industry. The, the, most of the time, what we found out also is uh, hybridizing systems, of course, are uh, optimal for small wind by matching especially wind and solar systems. Uh, this happens especially well in areas where, for example, the, the monsoon season uh, coincides with the need for, let's say, water pumping. Uh, and in some cases, we found that uh, global, global climate change, even monsoon season, sometimes there's not so much rain. Uh, we have a project in uh, Maharashtra, for example, where they decided to do a hybrid uh, wind and solar water pumper, because even though in monsoon, it uh, it's supposed to rain, they weren't getting enough rain, and, uh, and it's the windy area, it, it's the windy season. So uh, you have to look at each site individually, and in order to do that, you really need to have enough capacity, local capacity to know which type of installation or where, where does wind and solar as a hybrid can be effectively installed. Uh, wind uh, energy and small wind in general is a little bit more complex than solar. Solar is a little bit easier to install. But the, the advantage with wind is it blows uh, basically at night. And it, it, uh, generally what you want to see is you want to see applications where the wind regime matches the need of energy at the site. And uh, so this is a case-by-case -case basis. It's not like a universal uh, Thumb, but they, you really need to understand wind in order to do a proper installation. It, nonetheless, what we found out is that by developing the training programs, by training village mechanics how to build uh, towers, build systems, it uh, also enhances the industry because, for example, we specialize in small wind turbines that are less than kilowatts in size. Uh, but whenever there's a client that needs a bigger system, then we obviously recommend the suppliers of larger systems. But at least the people that are trained to install a small wind turbine, they can also install a slightly bigger machine. So the, what we see is in order to grow the industry in general around India is uh, to continue doing trainings. We obviously support open source technologies. And uh, we see that uh, productive applications are critical components for the development of systems in rural areas. And when I talk about uh, this type of application, it's, it's water pumping, uh, dehydration, uh, value processing, being able to link the renewable energy system, be it wind, solar, or any other renewables, to some application that uh, brings the income into the community. And uh, renewable energy systems require maintenance. Uh, they require, in, in some cases, changing batteries. And unless you have an income generating application in the renewable energy system, it becomes very difficult to justify and to maintain. Uh, so I, in, in our case, we are strongly linked, uh, linking small wind and our small hybrid systems to productive uses. This is the most important aspect. 
thank you very much for that. I think, uh, yeah, especially the um, bringing in the sustainability by linking it to productive um, use so that, yeah, you have a more cyclical approach to it. I think that's, uh, that's useful. So thanks, Mr. Horge, for that and the inspirational work taken up by uh, Minvayu. Um, and now I think uh, both Mr. John Daniel and Mr. Jorge have, um, you know, um, they've spoken about the different levels, but there are also a, a few pieces that resonate in terms of, um, you know, how you need to, you know, hybridize it and you need to, you know, engage with these. So we're slightly shifting gear and um, we will now start discussing bioenergy and we'll come back to both of them very uh, soon. But thank you both. Um, now, um, in terms of the next technology that we're going to discuss, uh, my question is for Dr. Subramanian. And uh, thanks again for such an illuminating presentation on the biofuel production uh, technologies. Um, now, um, given, given what you presented, uh, Dr. Subramanian, how do you see um, these competing? Um, so one is, yes, there is this need to have hybrid systems, but sometimes when it comes to policies or, you know, there is this, assumption of thinking about them in silos and wind and solar as Mr. Jorge was also mentioning they tend there is greater acceptance of the more mainstream technologies so how do you see this um, vis-a-vis other distributed renewable energy technologies and uh, from the point of R&D and, and also your experience of taking this to policy uh, makers what do you think is required uh, apart from the technology to mainstream this. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, yes, the bioenergy when compared to the commercial like solar and wind, they are all almost in the commercialized stage. Here, the problem is the raw material which has different properties. For example, if the rice straw it has different properties, are we so we cannot go with a single technology for a single uh, biomass. So that is a major lacuna in that. If you develop a technology, if it is for, for example, for fermentation for sugary material means the same setup cannot be used for cellulose based material. So that is a major lacuna. They are all more feed specific technology. That is a major problem, number one. Number two uh, is about the decentralized production, am I right? That your generation, what is your question about that? Yeah, uh, here, um, like other technologies, these are all from the from the source because we have we used to have the term as negative feed price. Means we need to dispose the material. That is a major aim. So if we go for the economics, like we do something to the feed, then there will be a cost. But here it has to be disposed. For example, coir pit. Initially, what we had the problem with the coir pit, the people in the industry, they will hope you know the coir pit, the coconut, the dust, not the coconut, uh, this one, material outer coat. It's a dust material, it cannot be composted easily. So people used to give money to the people who are is taking the material from the industry. Now we have some technology to utilize that uh, coir pit. So now people are ready to sell the uh, coir pit to the outside. So we, we similarly, we have the technology advancement is there. So all the biomass which are all available will be converted into useful product. The second question is we are not, we cannot run away from the production of the biomass. As I said, we are nearing about 138 uh, crores of mouth. We need to feed everybody. So definitely we will be producing all the biomass. Although it has to be converted, otherwise it will be, it will lead to the environmental problem. If we, if we keep all the materials, there will be a leaching, there will be a problem of groundwater uh, problem, then and the environment will be affected. So not only in the terms of energy, in terms of environment also, we need to work on the conversion of all these biomaterials into some useful products. So that is a two way around, not only the technology, we need to convert them into useful products. That is the need of the hour. So definitely people will be working on that. When we compare to around 20 years back, more technology, even the farmers are interested to convert the material. The loose biomass like cotton stock is available in the in, uh, farmer's field. They are interested to convert that into big bites. 
it's a densification of the material so it's similar to the firewood it can be used as a fuel in the boilers so such types of technologies are available so this is a way we need to there is a need of the hour we need to use all the technologies uh, for the production of the different materials from biomass hopefully i answered the question if there is anything is left out i will again you kindly clarify i will give you the answer for that yes thanks dr subramaniam so my second part was also how do you um, how do you so there are technologies but what what is required to mainstream them how do you make policy makers um, how do you present this to policy makers or what is required for that mainstreaming yeah sure that is there uh, for example mnrd already started a subsidization central financing means assistance has been given for the small biogas plant this year it is not that but uh, for the larger industries who are having uh, liquid bio waste now they are converting it they don't need any of the subsidies because they are getting energy that is bio methanation plant is there for example in tamil nadu in sago industries they earlier had most of the liquid waste when you travel through that road you can feel that waste materials lakhs of liters of waste material was available that liquid now effectively converted through bio methanation technology now they don't need any of the subsidy because the production is more they can produce electricity then they run their own industry that is similar to co generation in sugar industries so the biomass is available that can be converted into easily to other uh, mainly electricity that will be good so larger scale production if you consider that will be easier for the people to adopt smaller scale at the village level or the um, in, um, so house level there will be a problem house level small biogas plants are never there, there but uh, industry level larger biogas plants similar constructions are there but community level the collection of the bio waste is a problem so we need to work on that Uh, thanks for throwing light on that uh, dr subramanya so yeah i think it's yeah really that that matter of that middle level scale right because you probably um, have a market at that larger scale but uh, yeah what is viable at this community level is something uh, that needs to be thought for so uh, thanks for that and um, to our final panelist by no means uh, the least uh, so my next question is to miss uh, vanita and taking off from uh, what uh, dr subramaniam was mentioning um as a technology entrepreneur what market opportunities are you seeing uh, where you know you would um, um and how what do you think is required to capitalize on those and and what really motivated you to think of this as a scalable um viable entry point thank you ma'am uh, for asking this question uh my main motivation to start uh, this entrepreneur journey from a scientist to this entrepreneur is that uh, in my opinion anaerobic digestion is the heart of circular economy and we have to use this particular technology to make a, a lot of value added product so for my first focus was to get these microbes because that is the main thing and i was uh, working on to the health of these microbes that was my motivation because for the small biogas plants also these microbes are required and these uh, rural people doesn't know uh, a lot of things so what are the things i can make the make this technology a user friendly technology to use this because there are a lot of biogas plant uh, made in india and they were not functioning so even the larger biogas plant so there is a, a challenge and that was my motivation to start uh, this particular venture and what we are trying to build is uh, health tonics for this particular microbes apart from that as uh, sir has mentioned there are a lot of ways to use this biomass there they they are, these biomass will be competed by all these technology and there will not be a uh, one technology there might be the because of the availability of these biomass at local places we can have a combination of uh, technology but when we come to the policy if we say that this agriculture waste will go to bioethanol that will not survive the uh, uh, this thing but uh, we have to see that how this bio uh, waste will be used there there are some particular type of waste which are good for bioethanol there are some kind of waste which is good for biogas and now there is another technology which might be a competitive technology that is bio hydrogen 
which will be coming from this particular waste. So that that there in uh, when we are making biofuel policy, we have to consider all these uh, points. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. So we actually have two questions uh, here, which I would request you and Dr. Subramaniam to uh, also respond to. And perhaps you would right now, since you're just unmuted. So uh, the first is, uh, so we have a biofuel policy, but as highlighted, the bio waste collection at scale is difficult. How can this problem be solved? What are the job opportunities in this space? Uh this particular, like if we talk about the, uh, Lachwar was mentioning the community waste, uh, what we are trying to do is ward wise, if you are collecting the segregated MSW, you can convert it into biogas. There can be a decentralized plant. But uh, for uh, an agriculture waste, like if you are uh, collecting a rice straw, that can be converted to bioethanol. There can be a refinery kind of concept. A bigger plant can be uh, built up. For uh, municipality waste, segregated municipality, you can have a decentralized mode, wherein the transportation cost is not too much, so that you can reduce your total carbon footprint. Otherwise, you are transporting it to a, a huge distance. So, household biogas plants, community-based biogas plants are, uh, are a fruitful sol solution for MSW. For sewage treatment, similarly, if we are doing, if we are converting the sludge to the biogas, these plants can be a uh, plants which can be having a revenue, like Sir was mentioning, a lot of effluent treatment when we are using an anaerobic reactor there, they can have their waste treatment as a resource rather than a burden to them. So industries are focusing on to that. Now that, that gives them to benefit their water is tre treated, water can be reused and they can have an energy benefit. So that's why this particular technology has a benefit to them. So for them, they will be using this and there will be a decentralized mode uh, because at the source, they will be having an effluent treatment plant. So that's how we can contribute to have a lot of uh, decentralized uh, units, which can be our energy generating units. If these energy, but there is no grid uh, right now for biogas till this point. But since this technology is in a uh, in a nascent state right, right now in India, but if this these plants are there, we can have a centralized grid, which can give you bio CNG. And uh, as per Niti Aayog's uh, uh, data, if we convert our whole MSW only, we will be energy surplus. If we convert our MSW into uh, the organic fraction of the MSW, we will be energy surplus. That is the potential we have. Sure, thank you, Dr. Prasad. Dr. Subramanian, do you have anything to add? to? Dr. Prasad's uh, reflections? Yes, uh, as uh, rightly said by Dr. Vanita, the segregation is the key in all this so in the municipal, because municipal waste into thought. So we need to educate the people. Now here we are doing, we have a green color and blue color or something like that. So initial phase separation is the key in all this. Once if we segregate it, we have the plan in Pambutar also, in all the... Uh, this block level. So biogas plants can be filled with the biodegradable waste. So th that is a key. That is a major idea. We need to start from the collection of the waste, then all the other technologies can be adopted. For example, hospital like uh, very uh, medical waste can be incinerated. So that may not brought into this category. So once segregated is done, then we can treat them easily. That's it. Uh, thank you. Actually, there's a related uh, question in chat on um, how are we prioritizing second generation uh, biofuel resource, right? Among municipality waste and uh, residue. Um, so, yeah, would you would you like to add further to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, here they have listed municipality waste, residue wood, and agro industries. Let me take it the other way. I will take up the first two in agro industry. So, we have technology, as uh, rightly ma'am said, we have biomethanation. I have quoted some of the examples like sago industry, pulping industry. Most of the agro industries, they are treating their liquid waste to produce biomethanation. 
that is a commercially it's a very proven technology once biogas is there we have commercial 100% commercial and engines so it can be used to generate electricity so they are self sustaining now they can export it to grid also so agro industries we start it's not a problem even some of the solid waste they make it into liquids or compost so value added products can be generated there won't be that is a zero waste technology of the industry this agro industries chemical industries there may be a problem but agro industries are doing good in as we have technologies to convert bio waste to useful products then residue woods directly can be used as a fuel because smaller branches pieces can be done then sawdust we have a technology like bequets so that can be densified as already said that can be mixed with some other bio agro waste so that will be produced like a fuel load material that can be used further as a densified fuel then municipal waste we have already discussed in lengthy segregation is taken then further we can adopt whatever the suitable technology it can be there in chennai we have in coimbatore vegetable market we have biomethylation plant also similarly based on the waste we can in municipality waste we can segregate and we do the technology thank you thank you dr subramanian dr prasad you have anything to add yeah all these waste with like sir has mentioned can be used but if we consider only the municipality waste uh, around if we are using this whole municipality uh, waste organic waste which is segregated at house level or a building level then you will be getting a lot of uh, incentives because you will be having a dry waste which is uh, a clean waste that can be also processed so segregation is a key that is very important for msw if you are segregating but industrial waste with these kinds of technology can be used there and then thank you very much uh, for that so i have one final round of quest questions for all of you and that's uh, it's just one question and we can we can uh, start with mr john daniel um so first what um what is that one wicked problem that you think is uh, the you know the biggest barrier for uh, the uh, sort of scaling up and acceptance um, of uh, small wind vis-a-vis -vis other hybrid technologies uh, and second what is your um, wish list um, when when you think of this as a success you 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 uh, you explain the enablers you you gave us indications of uh you know success factors but yeah what what do you, what would you aspire for yeah i, I think i agree also more with, time but yeah okay. yeah no problem i think i agree with horhe also training is very important for small wind because at the end uh, what we see it happens all the time in all the countries is that you can have a technology but that is not working not because of the technology but because the way you install it or where do you install it and small wind is is very important where to where to install the turbine and that that you have very good wind resources so training is key and and i think what what i would like to see and i haven't seen in basically in any any of the countries that have small wind is is to have policies that support a small wind but thinking about the future and thinking about creating a technology in how that can be actually sell or exported to other countries so most of the the policies we saw in small wind uh they were making a way that basically you you put the turbine and you make some money out of this but but not to create technology in the country that can be exported and can be can grow in the country so one of the the, the most important or, or one of the the barriers for small wind to to reduce price is that any of the companies who are producing have a mass production so the so the price will never go down until a company can produce more so right now we only have few companies with few people and it's basically all made by hand in in, in one small factory so that the price will never go down if, if we don't have any mass production but for that we need a policy that is long term policy something that can last over 10 years so 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 companies can can be created and can grow in, in time so that's what I, i would like to see from a policy from 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 the country and i think india has a very good chance because of the size of the country the resources you have so so i think is it, it can be a very good if india can have some uh, supporting policy that can actually be enable to the creation of new companies and new technology there so i think that's all yeah for now. thank you so much actually that's a very significant point because it's also about uh, um, making your supply chain more resilient and strengthening uh, that and making it more reliable yeah.
So yeah, that's very crucial. Thank you so much for that, uh, Jean Daniel. And I'll move on to Jorge. Uh, your your one wicked problem and and one thing you aspire for. Yes, I uh, agree that uh, Daniel uh, is an uh, issue that he sees, but uh, I would say, and I stress uh, localization, being able to build locally the technology is uh, I believe in the open source movement and it's the sharing of technology. So it's actually global technologies uh, for local development, uh, local uh, So it's kind of putting the globalization down. Uh, but I believe that for, especially for biomass, for wind, uh, these are two products that totally be needed in India for the 21st uh, century. And uh, we, one last thing is the oldest wind turbine I've ever worked on was in here. Yeah. So a small wind or wind in general lasts a very long time. Uh, so those are the two key aspects that I would like to stress that uh, it can be local, make a good job, obviously, and, uh, and it can last long. So obviously policies will be necessary. And uh, for example, I don't see any policy directly targeting small wind. And uh, mostly it's uh, solar, for example. And I think hybrids uh, policies will advance now. Paris for hybrids are great. But the uh, a drawback that we see here, for example, in Tamil Nadu, is the, the rules and regulations. There's a lot of red tape involved in the, the process. So if the process can be transparent, like in any other country in the world, where actually the, the builder, the manufacturer, is the one getting the subsidies and the kind of big government scheme where where there's a lot of red tape on this which help a lot in general for the when yeah thank you so much for that and and yeah um I really like the the sort of the focus on, on pushing for open source technologies which sort of makes that process innately more democratic and accessible in that sense as well. Uh, but yeah totally take both of you up on the uh, on the policy as well. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Subramanian, your thoughts? Yes. So, yes. Yeah, you are asking, okay. Uh, now uh, there should be awareness about the, because during COVID uh, we might have experienced people are now moving from the commercial or uh, the high end technology to the natural oriented thing. because it, there is a force to adopt all these things. Similarly, there should be awareness to adopt such type of technology because that is natural oriented what we are suggesting. They have all the materials, feed materials, for example, kitchen waste can be used to produce biogas. We have food waste and the kitchen waste. Smaller um, portable biogas plants are available. So such type of smaller technologies are available so people can adopt all these things. Only the thing, the availability of such type of biogas should be there. So that can reduce your fuel consumption, LPG, um, to a larger way. So awareness creation, number one. Number two, uh, the competence of these technology with the commercial technology is somewhat difficult. Because they need to install a biogas plant, they need to work every day. They are in their hurried life with, such type of works are somewhat problem. Even in the rural area, uh, biogas plants are not that much successful nowadays because there are no labors to mix the cow dung with water and to do all these such type of the things. So once these things are once well established with automation, it should be once you have to switch on and it has to come out. Such type of technology people are interested. So once it is being adopted, after that conversion will be there, then a wider way of publication of such technologies will be taken. Okay. Uh, and there was one there was one question in uh, question and answer session. I am not able to understand the question because what do you think of a scenario where a policy and regulation is brought out for implementation of renewable energy technologies in residential sector during approval stage itself? I don't know what they mean. Uh, if I'm right, I don't know. I will try to answer as for my understanding. 
in residential areas there are based of renewable and energy technology has been already taken up mainly for solar and such type of smaller wind uh, turbines uh, solar we have rooftop solar uh, uh, panels are available and also we have net metering so whatever is generated will be calculated whatever you are getting from the grid also calculated so such type of uh, policy regulations are there so that can be it is one of the technologies as from my understanding and solar water heaters are there that will reduce the uh, your power consumption initially subsidy was there similar to our tvs and mobiles we don't need any subsidy we are ready to purchase whatever the cost we are with so similarly this is commercialized and people are adopting it so now the subsidies are available so people can go for that and you can they can use so initial the government will support to familiarize the technology after that people will start using on this thing. so these technologies are available looked up for solar and uh, water uh, heaters so i hope i answered if anything else can be let me thank you thank you so much uh, for that so um so yeah next uh, to uh, dr vanita uh, and as as you uh, reflect on the wicket barrier and the and what you aspire for for this tech, uh, these technologies uh, could you also answer this additional question i think which is on uh, considering waste composition is uh, changing um, municipal solid waste based biogas generation plants may not have adequate waste to process how do you perceive this as a problem yeah so so these are some of the barriers we have because the composition of the feed material will always change so what i uh, we are trying as a company is to standardize these particular mm -hmm. microbes suppose you have a changed uh, composition we have to monitor it there and then and that is where sir has mentioned that there should be an automation so we have created an app wherein the the operator will be adding all those values we will be monitoring it at a centralized uh, uh, place and giving them the instruction accordingly because there might be a change in the composition leading to more volatile fatty acid which can uh, change the composition of uh, whole digester and accordingly we have to monitor that plant so those are the things which needs to be established so that these small operators can uh, do those things as sir has mentioned there is an automation required because nobody wants to mix this with the water and then add to the plant and all those things so that's why a very small biogas plants are not a success as such but the community based plants can be a successful plants from where they can get a lot of energy as well as fertilizer if we are using at a rural level so those are the targeted uh, things and regarding what they have mentioned even for the press mud kind of plant there will be a uh, seasonal kind of uh, waste which will be generated so for that particular plant either we have to uh, 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 get other waste we have to have some 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 way from where the surroundings other waste can be fed during those lean period or we have to map something some other thing but what i am trying to do is to maintain those plants uh, during that particular lean period also with their waste material only what they have i i we can uh, make a plan so that their uh, biogas plant is uh, stabilized during the lean period also with their waste only at this particular point but the best way is to map other waste material which is there in the surroundings during that lean period that can be done so for that we need to have uh, really some kinds of uh, uh, digital technologies to all mapping all these things and as waste sector is just uh, uh, coming as an industrial sector it was a very org unorganized sector till few years back in last 4 to 5 years only this sector has become an industrial kind of sector so here a lot of entrepreneurs are ent entering to manage these kinds of waste so that's why i am very very much hopeful that within 3 4 years we will find these biogas plants running uh, with the, all the whatever waste material is available suppose we are not getting an msw there we we are getting something from the vegetable market waste at that particular day there is an excess that can be rooted uh, by the near near plants if we have five, four or five plants in a particular place say say i i will take an example of noida noida has 5 7 
a decentralized plant and in one plant we have an excess of waste there and in other plant we have less of the waste that day that can be mapped so these these all things are possible now with the digital technology so that is where i am looking forward that this this will not be a problem and change in waste composition we as biotechnologists can manage that that is uh, as a biotechnologist we can manage we can monitor those plants there what is the change in the composition and we can feed it that is not an issue thank you so much uh, dr vanita and uh, we're almost at time so um, i would like to thank our panelists for your valuable time and insights uh, on this um, i will now hand this over to uh, masik uh, over to you masik and thank you so much to all the panelists thank you tara thank you everyone i mean this is very insightful discussion now we can see there is a great demand of you know policies and awareness to make this technology successful now uh, uh, let me invite kajol who is the senior manager wr india energy team to give her closing remarks thank you over to you kajol thank you thank you mas pick and thank you tara for moderating the session um thank you everyone for joining us today for the webinar this is really a uh, ajul uh, your so voice is and what is happening in the and uh, can you hear me now okay, let me just switch up the video is this better now yes yeah exactly so thanks thanks mas for um we really appreciate uh, the time taken out by our panelists and speakers to discuss the challenges um and what are the ways to look forward in the small wind turbine and biofuel and what are the on ground challenges and what are the on ground realities that are lying in there um and um you know i i also request all the speakers and panelists to please switch on their videos we just want to take a one snapshot and i'm also thankful to all the participants for joining and putting out their questions and help us to go more inside and to get more uh, you know valuable information from the panelist uh, we saw how the supply chain constraint and the standards are impacting uh, the small wind turbine and uh, how the important is to look at the skills and the job creation for small wind turbine for the growth of the sector um, and similar and the uh, almost the overlapping challenges also lie in the biofuel sector uh, where we want to look at the policies and the regulations apart from the challenges being put forward by the um, technology and the aggregation of the biomass um there was a well pointed out by our panelists that we need policy and incentives to promote our drg system that involves the rg re sources and this is something that we are also planning to do uh, and discuss during our next set of webinar that is scheduled by the end of next month so we look forward for everyone's participation during our next webinar um we will also um, be circulating a survey questionnaire after this webinar so request everyone to please participate in the survey and respond to it the recording of the video will be available on our website even website as well as on the youtube so um, yeah you can always refer to these video recordings and with the uh, panel discussions that we had so thank you thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you for the uh, thank you for moderating the session utra can we have a group photograph now yes yeah. kajal please put the request to switch on your video please Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks and bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank bye. You. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.